Welcome to Nenomore's Chapter 20, Notes, The Coming of the War. So we're going to go from Lincoln's inaugural to the preface of the beginning of the war, getting set up for four years of misery. His inaugural address, now everything's already happened under Buchanan. He's taken over already in 61. In your hands, my dissatisfied fellow countrymen, and in not in mine, is a momentous issue of civil war. So he's saying, hey, don't look to me about civil war. It's going to be you who starts it. The government will not assail you. You can have no conflict without yourselves being the aggressors. You have not oath registered in heaven to destroy the government, while I have the most solemn one to preserve, protect, and defend it. And if those words sound familiar, they should. Those are the, that's part of the oath that the president has to take. So preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Uh, so, whoops. Lincoln maintains that the Union is indivisible. Secession is not allowed. And attempts to place the burden of conflict on the South, saying, hey, it's going to be on them. I'm not going to throw the first punch. But Buchanan, what's he been doing? Nothing. The schmuck. He's let every single U.S. facility fall under Confederate hands, except for Fort Pickens in Florida and Fort Sumter in South Carolina. Now, Charleston, South Carolina, is the heart and soul of cotton trade across the seas to Britain. Uh, of <laughs> getting weapons from. So, big deal here. In the fall of 1858, Stephen Douglas defeated Abraham Lincoln and won re-election as senator from Illinois. But the tall country lawyer was now well known, and the issue of slavery had risen to the top of the national agenda. Just two years later, following a contentious election, Lincoln was elected president of the United States. A shudder of horror rippled through the South as newspapers recorded. The New Orleans press, the northern people in electing Mr. Lincoln, have perpetrated a deliberate, cold-blooded insult and outrage on the people of the slaveholding states. The Richmond Dispatch, the election of Abraham Lincoln, has put the country in peril. The Augusta Constitutionalists, the South should arm at once. Before Lincoln even had the chance to take office, southern states began seceding from the Union. Alexander Stevens was a leading southern figure. All efforts to save the Union will be unavailing. The truth is, our leaders and public men do not desire to continue it on any terms. South Carolina led the way. Mississippi, one of the richest states in the nation, followed eagerly. So did Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas. In all, 11 states would leave the Union and form the Confederate States of America. In February 1861, those Confederate states elected their own president, Jefferson Davis of Mississippi. At his inauguration, he said, all we ask is to be left alone. The audience was large and brilliant, but beyond them, I saw troubles and thorns innumerable. My opinion was that there would be war, long and bloody, and that it behooved everyone to put his house in order. The following month, at his own inauguration in Washington, a now bearded Abraham Lincoln tried to reassure the angry South. We are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. Just six weeks later, on April 14, 1861, Southern guns fired on a small federal fort in the harbor at Charleston, South Carolina. An eyewitness described it. A perfect sheet of flame flashed out. A deafening roar, a rumbling, deadening sound, and the war was on. For 84 years since the signing of the Declaration of Independence, the United States had stood strong as a free republic. 
Now, the issue of slavery, the terrible contradiction at the nation's center, was putting at risk the entire American experiment in freedom. The last ray of hope for preserving the Union peaceably expired at the assault upon Fort Sumter. This issue embraces more than the fate of these United States. It presents to the whole family of man the question whether a constitutional republic can or cannot maintain its integrity. All right, Northerns respond with shock and anger. Now Lincoln got what he wanted. He wanted the South to take the first punch, and they did. Now he can say, they started it. Look what they're doing. He declared an insurrection and called for 75,000 volunteers. The South responded just as strongly. Finally, the last four of the Confederacy uh, join in with North Carolina being last. Tennessee actually being last, but eh. Raised troops quickly and struggled to equip and train them before settling into battle. Now, communication lines are open, and the South indicates that attempts to reinforce it with troops would be a hostile act. So Lincoln says, hey, I, I, I'm just bringing them supplies. I'm not bringing uh, reinforcements. I'm not bringing more troops. <clears throat> Confederate Congress urges the taking of the forts, and so Major Anderson agrees to surrender in two days' time. Delay is refused, and Fort Sumner is fired upon April 12, 1861. It's known later on, after the war has already gone on, that the officers felt that if the chance for war were not taken, it would slip away, and with it, Southern independence. So the Southerners take the first shot, not wanting this opportunity to slip away. The effects. Now all of a sudden, the Union all comes together on one side, indeed brought many over to the cause. Places the burden of disunion on the South. They started it. They were the ones who were treasonous. Lincoln calls for 75,000 volunteers. All right. What's critical you got to understand about this time period are the border states. If the border states join the South, there will be no civil war. It's over. Just logistics alone. You got all the critical waterways all locked in. There. It's just, there's no chance. Population, uh, supplies, rail, it just can't happen. So those border sites definitely need to uh, um, become to the north. Now, Virginia, North Carolina, and Tennessee, they were likely to go. But Critical border states, Maryland, Kentucky, Missouri. Why? In Delaware, eh, not so much, but why? What's the big deal about them? Well, first off, Maryland and Missouri only held by the presence of federal troops throughout the war. They, you know, they probably would have gone. Kentucky is allowed to basically a neutral position. So they're frankly trading with the South during the war. And the Union successfully detaches West Virginia from Virginia in 1861. Now, historian Morrison's contention is that it was truly a brother's war. Uh, an example is Lee's agony. Lee was asked by Lincoln to be general of the army, and he turns it down because he sees himself as a Virginian first. He's anti-slave. He's anti-secession. Uh, Brothers fought, uh, brothers mostly fought side by side, but there are many examples of father, son, brother versus brother fighting on opposite sides of a battle. So let's look at the military advantages and disadvantages. First, the South. Wait a second. Union advantages. First off, population. They got the people. Railroads. Factories. Navy. The Union's already got an existing government. And food, the breadbaskets in the North. 
take a look at the railroad track wheat production the only thing the south has is cotton production i mean gun factories for god's sakes the confederacy does have some major advantages one they don't have to go and conquer the north the north has to come to their home court and conquer them also <laughs> And the northern generals suck for a while. It's the southern generals who rock. I mean, they are awesome military men. So the major disadvantage to the north in that, that you got Lee, Jackson, Longstreet, just the who's who of American greats. And it won't be till the middle of the war that you get Grant and Sherman and such really poking their heads out and taking a lead in the north. <coughs> and morale. Most white Southerners were willing to fight to protect their way of life. The North, eh, would you want to die to save the Union? Is that worth dying for? Now, when the issue becomes slavery, now we're going to have something different with the Emancipation Proclamation. Also, you know if you play sports, home turf is everything. Their supplies are right there. Their neighbors are right there. Hey, we need food. The North has to constantly ship stuff in. And the South has a strong military tradition. Their boys know how to shoot. Their boys know how to ride. They know how to take orders. They know military tactics. The North, not so much. Okay, South fighting a defensive war similar to the colonists during the American Revolution, don't have to attack the North. The South also was an immense area without any capitals, any major cities. Yeah, they had some major cities, but not really. Not like the North. Also, superior moral cause for the uh, North. Come on, let's face it. They're fighting for self-determination, fighting to defend their homeland. Now, all bets are off with the Emancipation Proclamation. Then, superior moral uh, cause flips over to the north side. Definitely more talented officers on the south. Frontier background, they know how to shoot. They know the terrain, they know the climate. <coughs> and last but not least, another advantage, help from the British or the French Militarily, supply-wise. Now, your author, Bailey, contention that no revolution in history ever had a better chance of success than the South during the Civil War. I mean, you look at the what-if syndrome, is what if this, what if that. But, I mean, they really had a lot of things going for them. Uh, if Gettysburg had just gone a, one different way, whole different ballgame. Now, advantages and disadvantages for the North. We've already seen the graphs. Now, railroads, I'm talking about a military advantage, being able to move your troops back and forth by railroad, being able to move your supplies back and forth by railroad. Of course, the banks, the structure for the banking is all up north. And come on! Do not underestimate the fact that they had Lincoln. Lincoln was the man. Uh, uh, finally, he would have to interfere in military strategy himself. He didn't care what the generals called him. He didn't care what, just as long as they won. You have Jefferson Davis lost in the details while Lincoln sees the big picture, the ultimate cause. Also, North had superior government structure. They already had a capital. They already had their tested constitution. South had to hold its union together without the philosophical ability to deny dissatisfied the right of secession. So now, the South with the government, hey, if uh, Mississippi wants to secede, they can. If South Carolina wants to secede, they can. Hey, th isn't that the premise for what they left the Union with? So the stronger states makes them 
weaker in the fight against the North. And of course, the Navy's in the Union hands. Population's a blowout, and it gets worse over the, the war for the South, since the South immigrants don't go South. They're going to the cities in the North to find jobs. <laughs> they become draftees. So natural population increase and also immigration. That's the end of chapter 20 notes.